<sighs> Knights of Azure 2. <laughs> a game that is not afraid to show you what it's about from the get-go. Not only that, but it wears its identity like a badge of honor. Indeed, this is why I was tempted to play it in the first place, since I just wanted to see how far they were willing to go with all this. As always, first impressions are important, and uh, presentation-wise, Knights of Azure 2 doesn't really disappoint. You have a nice, soothing theme welcoming you at the title screen, which um, really isn't indicative of the soundtrack at all. You see, most of the in-game music is uh, actually pretty decent J-Rock, something that strikes me as quite odd. You see, it seems strange to me how you only ever hear rock and metal music from Japanese games these days. I don't know, I struggle to remember a recent action game made in the West that actually has rocking music to pump you up. In any case, the game begins with a little bit of exposition that would make radical leftists and modern feminists very, very happy. In a world where men are nowhere to be seen, an invasion of demons has begun. All these demons have a defining characteristic. They all have blue blood. No, really, they are blue bloods. So you know that they are members of the bourgeoisie, so they are responsible for all the bad things happening in the world. It is up to you, as an agent of the Curia, to kill them all and purge their influences from this world once and for all. The prologue opens up with glorious Nippon hot girls with huge plots sporting varying degrees of jiggliness and copious amounts of pantsu. Before you start playing the game, you'll be bombarded with some tutorial text boxes which will seem familiar if you've ever played any of the Warriors games. In fact, this is indeed a Warriors clone in all respects, but with some changes here and there. You have all the usual Musou ga gauges, your focus attacks, all of them renamed, given titles full of uh, dirty innuendo. You, of course, have your basic light and heavy attacks, you can block attacks, dodge, and use items. You can also lock onto your enemies if you think that will protect you from nausea caused by the completely unreliable camera. You can also string light and heavy attacks together to do different combos to fight relatively hmm, large groups of enemies. The more of them you kill, the more your Lily Burst meter will fill up, allowing you to unleash a very powerful strike. This will be instantly familiar to all fans of the Warriors games, but even for the rest of you, that shouldn't be too hard to get to grips with. The game obviously uses the same engine as all the Warriors games, which means the graphics are fine, but nothing too spectacular. The environments look okay, but the secondary object pop-in is hideous. The animations are great at times, especially during combat, but really stiff looking at others, like when you're interacting with the environment or when you're watching a cutscene that is not very important to the story. As for the character models, well, they are pretty detailed, which is very important as you'll be looking at them a lot. After the introduction, the game will open up and you'll get to visit Hotel Eterna and its residents. The hotel will serve as your base of operations. There you can rest, save, talk to various characters, prepare for your next mission, upgrade your skills and select your partners called Lilies. These Lilies are specifically created to tick all the anime grill boxes. You have the old friend, which is now a rival, supposedly pure, but her mind is full of filth. You have the mature doctor with the glasses, you have the emotionless one who speaks in monotone, and so on and so forth. They all have different attributes and skills, as well as their own equipment slots and affinity bars. This means that if you want to get to know them better and kit them all out, you'll have to gather lots of materials and go to missions together. You cannot control the lilies yourself, but they all have their own unique abilities. Also, if you do particular things in combat, the tension meter will fill up. When it's full, you can do a pair-up attack that's different for each lily. You can also change everyone's outfits when you get them, and they're all designed to make you harden the fuck up. You can choose one lily and up to two servants to take with you every time you leave the hotel. These servants are little magical animal spirits that have various attributes. They are generally divided into two categories, Tricker and Striker. Tricker types have particular attacks that you can use as long as they have MP. They are also used to take down certain barriers that block access to areas of each stage. For example, Nero, the, uh, the first servant you get. 
is a cat that can unleash some fire-based attacks. It can also be used to burn down walls of flammable briars to open up areas otherwise inaccessible to a luge. Striker types can actually transform into other weapons for you to use, like partisans and greatswords, giving you access to new combos and attacks. Their MP keeps running out as long as they're transformed though, so you have to keep an eye out. As you might suspect, different servants are useful in different situations, and all stages have multiple types of barriers to take down, so you'll have to make decisions on which ones to take with you each time you visit a stage. Servants also have their own experience in leveling up mechanics and can evolve, becoming much stronger in the process. Now, all this is fine and dandy, however, the main thing that happens after the prologue is that you'll end up with Alouche, the protagonist, becoming the thing she was fighting against. Infected with the blue blood, she will have to struggle to retain her humanity, living in the grey area between good and evil. Constantly under suspicion from those close to her, she will have to fight against all odds to stop the bourgeois and possibly save herself from the curse. This is where I realize that I'm making it sound much more interesting than it actually is, since that all the dialogue and story progress is like a very typical Moe anime with the uh, lesbian overtones cranked up to 11. Which is no bad thing, actually. Now, there are some attempts to add mystery and complexity, but... Eh, it's all as flat as the character's asses. In gameplay terms, what the curse actually does is impose a time limit to your endeavors. The curse of the blue blood gives Alush a handful of days before she completely becomes a member of the 1% and the game ends. This means that every time you leave the hotel, you'll have a time limit within which you must achieve your objective. Now that can be a story or a side mission, or just a material hunting excursion at any particular stage. Whatever it is you choose to do, you have a limited amount of time to do it, and you cannot move to another stage. You can only return to Hotel Eterna, where time stops. There, you can recover and rest before the day ends, the timer resets, and the cycle continues. This may sound restricting, and it kind of is, but, like another game with the time limit, Majora's Mask for example, there are ways to make it easier on yourself. There are certain areas in the stages which are guarded by powerful demons. If you kill them, a magical doorway opens. Finding other such doorways creates connections that let you save time when moving around in the stage. Also, every time you kill demons, you absorb their blue blood, which is the equivalent of gaining experience. At the end of each day, upon your return to Hotel Eterna, you can cleanse yourself from the bourgeois filth by donning a very tight, tight white suit that will convert the blue blood into experience. That experience can then be used to upgrade Alouche in one of three talent trees, all three with multiple tiers. One of these talents actually increases your time limit for each day. Also, at the end of each story chapter, after you destroy a boss, you get some days back, so to speak, so you can see that um, time constraints are a situation that can be remedied. As you can surmise from all this, customization and choice is the name of the game, provided you have the willingness to spend the time necessary to do all these upgrades. You see, the problem with Knights of Azure 2 is that it feels weightless. Usually in a Warriors game you feel like you're controlling a powerful character, unleashing untold amounts of whoop ass on your hapless foes. For some reason this feeling is absent here. Even though you can see enemies die faster as you get stronger and the special attacks are always a treat for the eyes, the game is uh, lacking in the feedback department. Enemies always come in small groups and the sound effects are really weedy, making the entire combat feel hollow. And considering that this is a hack and slash game at heart, you can understand that this is a big problem. Now the game tries to mask its shortcomings by introducing hot sluts one after the other, from the uh, chocolate skinned moon queen to a spider semen demon, but it's not enough. At the end of the day, the core of the gameplay is anemic, and even though Knights of Azure 2 tries to make up for it with appealing girls and lots of things to grind for, the foundations it builds upon are not as solid as they should. So should you play this game? Hmm, maybe. 
I'd recommend it only if you like Warriors games and uh, the thought of looking at sexy anime girls participating in a shallow, low-tier story fills you with joy. Otherwise, eh, spend your money and time elsewhere.